It's not rocket science. It's just looking for repeatable patterns and then it's looking for multiple reasons why price is probably going to react in an area. So welcome back everyone to the Amazon Down with Mark Walton from the Forex Mentor Pro. We'll discuss his journey in trading, a lot of good knowledge here, a lot of good experience. So Mark, welcome on the podcast. How's it going today? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Uh, just getting rid of a hacking cough after uh, the bad weather in the UK at the minute, but uh, I'm going back to the Canary Islands in a few days, back to some sunshine. Where are you at the minute? Definitely. It's always a good thing when you can travel and, and, and move and, and trade at the same time. Uh, I'm in Thailand, very sunny, very beautiful. A lot of pollution though in Bangkok, so not the best for that, but I'm going to the beach uh, tonight, so actually a good thing. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Pretty no, cool. no. The, I, I, uh, my wife and I in 2017, 2018, we first started traveling any kind of uh, period of time. So we went to Australia and New Zealand for a couple of months, and uh, it was our 25th wedding anniversary. And I said, well, okay, let's. I want to do a test while we're doing this. Let's see if I can trade and pay for it out of the trading while we travel. And so I set the, the rule was that if I had a good week, we could stay in a five-star and if I had a bad week, we'd be in a three-star. <laughs> and uh, we had a few weeks where we didn't make a great deal, so we were in a three-star. And to be honest, I don't really mind. Uh, sometimes with the five-stars, they're too posh for me. Uh, but one of the things I learned, I don't know about you, but you have to kind of stay in some, – you have to stay somewhere for, in my experience, doing this three days at a time minimum. Because if you're constantly moving – you never get settled enough to get set up and things. So it's not quite the thing that you're moving every day. That that was one of the main takeaways from me uh, that I took from that. And and recently we went to Italy for a month and the same thing for the first few days, we'd, we'd booked Airbnbs for a few nights, but Airbnbs change nowadays. They After COVID, they don't want to let you in till four o'clock on an afternoon and they want you out at 10 o'clock on the morning. So even if you stay a couple of nights somewhere, you you only really got one day. So yeah, that was the main take for me when trying to to do this when traveling was to be based somewhere for three or four days. I mean, do you find that yourself or what's your own experience with it? Yeah, definitely. I try to stay away from Airbnbs. We can probably go into that a little bit later too, the, the traveling aspect of trading. Uh, but yeah, definitely one week is ideal in, in one place. Or yeah, three days, I would say minimum. Four days is a good sweet spot. But I kind of want to go back to the beginning a little bit. And you've been trading for 20 years. Tell me kind of how that all started up and what's the story behind you beginning trading 20 years ago or so. Well, I started trading uh, stocks in the 90s. So I, I, I lived through the dot-com boom, uh, which is very, very similar to what we've just seen with crypto. Uh, but in those days, you, you didn't have automated platforms. If you were working from home, you had to ring the broker. And uh, it was great for a while. You made a lot of money. It was easy. I mean, you could basically buy anything. Again, very similar to what we've just seen with crypto. And then, of course, the crash came. And being a rookie at that point, I held on too long. And most of the gains that I had made had gone. Uh, and again, very similar to crypto. There were a lot of companies that were appearing that had no real substance they, didn't, they weren't really doing anything that was revolutionary or different to anybody else, but they were all just diving into the sector. And uh, But I learned a lesson. I mean, I, I lived through the, the, the highs and the lows of that. And then 1999, I, I had a successful business, bricks and mortar business in the UK. Uh, I had a lot of staff, I had a lot of hassle and a lot of stress. And I, I was coming up to 40 and I said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. So we sold the business. Uh, we bought quite a few houses. In those days, the money was easy. It was cheap and it was easy to get money. Uh, my wife and I spent a year painting and decorating because we, we paid tradesmen for these houses. But this was to give us income. Uh, we sold our main property and we emigrated with four kids to the Canary Islands off the coast of Africa. And so that was a big, big change. Uh, I actually went singing and playing guitar in a band for a few years, which had been my one of my goals and uh, enjoyed that for a few years, uh, but not enough money. And uh, I had four kids in private school, so that was expensive. So I started looking for things to do online. Uh, usual thing, I, I learned to build websites, tried internet marketing, and then stumbled upon Forex. And in early 2001, 
there was hardly anything on the internet about Forex. And I bought a DVD off a guy in the UK and crying that I paid four and a half thousand dollars for this DVD. And uh, I, I think we give more value in our member site for $40, $50 a month than what I paid. But hey, that was what there was. So I learned this and this was technical. And it was strange because when I traded stocks in the 90s, it was all uh, fundamentals. There was no, I used to think technical was mumbo jumbo. You know, it was all these lines on chart. I didn't understand it. And I started doing this uh, system. It was 15 minute charts, which for me was the worst thing ever. But I can explain that in a little while. But the, I started to, to use the technical, and they say it worked. And suddenly you looked at Fibonacci, you looked at candlesticks and trend lines and things, and hey, this, this works. This is great. However, I, um, I had an issue. I, my, the business that I sold, we had retail shops, we had quite a few staff, and we also dealt with the prison service. So it was a highly regulated business where – we were controlled by the government. Uh, the prison service could turn up at any moment for a food audit or even for a, a paperwork audit to make sure who we were employing. So it was really strictly controlled on many levels by the government. So when I came to trading, if I'd have brought that discipline with me in the early days, I would have been successful a lot sooner. But because I suddenly was in an environment where I had money, hey, I'm a smart guy. This doesn't look that complicated. I can have a go at this, and I didn't bother with any rules. And uh, I spent the next two years gambling. And it wasn't trading. In retrospect, it was gambling. And it's ironic because I, I never bet on anything. I have zero interest in gambling. And yet I developed all the bad habits of a bad gambler. I was over-trading, revenge trading, over-leveraging. Uh, I was on a high when I was winning. I was on a low when I was losing all the usual things that, that people go through, particularly rookies. I saw the interview you did with Courtney Smith recently and some of the other big guys who've worked for the big funds. And, you know, you, you, you look at these guys and you, you see that they've worked for the big banks. They've traded hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, the conclusion that they came to is the same conclusion I came to. But I kind of say I came from the bottom up. You know, I was trading a, a $20,000 account of my own. Um, and, and as a retail trader sat there on your own, I was sat in a, I was living in a beautiful part of the world and I'm sat in a basement eight, nine hours a day trying to trade for a living. And I, I started to get better, but my issue was that I, as I, as I improved, the periods between meltdowns just got longer. And I tell the tale of the first week I, I set myself a target. I wanted to earn $2,000 a week doing this. And the first week that I actually did it after two years, I was on a high all weekend. You know, everybody and anybody, hey, I finally cracked this. And by the following Wednesday, I'd lost most of it. And that became a recurring pattern for me. Yes, I could I'd go longer periods of time, but when eventually I'll go into a meltdown, I would go into a meltdown. So I got to 2004. I'd been doing it for two years. It was wearing me out. In, and, and people are really, retail traders need to be very careful because it can make you ill. I mean, nowadays, everybody talks about mental health all the time, but it can make you ill. It's a solitary pastime. Nobody understands what you're doing. They all think you're gambling online, so you don't tell your friends and you don't tell family what you're doing. And uh, I needed a break. So I, I took a few months off, let the dust settle in my brain and you think about, hey, look, you know, you – you're a smart guy, but you're making a mess of this. What are you going to do? And for me, it was a case of I either would have to make a success of this or something else very quickly or go back to the UK with my tail between my legs and drag my kids who didn't want to emigrate in the first place back. So I had a real good incentive. Uh, I found a, a retired trader who also uh, specializes in psychology, a guy called Rich Friesen. Uh, Richard started trading for Merrill Lynch in the early 80s, and he then employed traders of his own, and then he, he was coaching bank traders for the psychology. And as, what, as we all come to realize, and again, going back to your Courtney Smith interview, it's all about this that screws people up. It's not the ability to do this. It, the process itself is not complicated, but it's the emotion, it's the lack of discipline, the lack of, lack of structure uh, that screws all of us. And ironically, it's, it's quite funny because I was talking to a, a private client the other day. 
couple of weeks ago, I had people within my mentor group who were getting a bit frustrated because this year it's been it's been messy. It's not been easy if you're trying to go with the trend because it's all over the place. And so I, I showed them how you could trade on shorter time frames on 30 minute charts. And I said, <laughs> the same week, this was a couple of weeks ago, the the market pattern changed back to my system. And normally for me nowadays, if, if I look at the charts at the start of a week and I don't see anything or it looks messy, I walk away. Uh, and learning to pick your battles is important when it comes to trading. Anyway, the normal strategy that I use, I had a successful week. I only had a few trades, but I made quite a lot of pips and I made 3.5% on my account. Great. Minimum amount of work, minimum amount of screen time. On the shorter time frames, I spent, I, I placed seven trades, I lost a quarter of a percent, and half of the bad habits that I had from 20 years ago started to come through again. I was, I was getting stressed with it, I was spending too much time looking at the screen, I got into one of the trades too soon that broke the rules, and so for me, with the help of Rich Freeze, and he... He taught me that with my personality type, I would be better to take a step back. And and he and I, uh, we were doing a, a, an interview like this where we we were, it was the London, no, it was the New York Open, I think. And Rich was sat there watching me and he had me wearing a heart monitor. And these days I was trading 15 minute charts and I went to make a trade and he went, stop. And I said, what's the matter? And he said, look, your heart rate's shot up. You've hunched forward. What are your legs doing? And my legs are going like crazy. And he just said, look, you are an emotional junkie with this, you know? It doesn't suit your persona and your personality to be doing this on shorter time frames. You would be better to step back and, and look at the bigger picture and make a, a more calculated decision. So... That in itself was brilliant for me because I went from spending eight, nine hours a day on my own in the basement whilst outside the kids are in the pool and beautiful weather and a beautiful place to live. And then I started just trading to four-hour charts. So I could watch London on a morning. I could go to the gym, go for a walk, come back half an hour before the four-hour candle close, make a decision what I'm going to do after the candle closes because, as we know, often price will come up, touch, and then reverse – um, and then again on an afternoon, and I started to be profitable. And Rich helped me work through some psych issues and different ways of, of approaching things. And and within a year, he introduced me to a fund in, a, in the US. It wouldn't be allowed these days, but it was a small fund where the head trader was ill and they wanted somebody to come in. And they gave me 20, 30 grand to start with. But by the end of the year, I was trading a million dollars. So this was great. And I think that's the, another big takeaway for retail traders. The the biggest One of the biggest issues retail traders is the expectation. They think that they can throw a thousand bucks into an account and they can quit the job in three months. You know, they see these pictures, these guys in, in Dubai with the Ferraris and, hey, I quit my job. And, 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 and the truth of it is you can't do it. If, if you have got limited funds, you are not going to be able to make enough money in the short term to satisfy that need. And let's face it, everybody wants to get rich quick. And trading, you're not going to get rich quick. Because if you're, if you're doing this on a small account, you let's say you make 5% in a month. Yeah, 5% on $1,000, you made 50 bucks. So what people should do is think of this as education. If you think, hey, I made 5% per month. If you were doing that on a million dollar account, you've just made 50K. And you were getting, as a trader, are getting a chunk of that. That's how you make money at this game. And so for me, that was the start of, of, of making money out of things. The other thing is when you're doing it for a fund or you're doing it where you're being monitored, it makes you more disciplined. You can't break the rules because if within a fund you start to break the rules, they'll kick you out. Uh, I, I know of a trader in the UK. and uh, I, I went to a, a presentation years and years ago. This guy had won the award for the best trader of the year. And they sacked him the following year. And they sacked him because he kept breaking the rules. And the, the reasoning behind it is, is if somebody breaks the rules consistently, A, there's always a risk that when they do start to screw up, they will go into meltdown, uh, a.k.a. Nick Leeson, who broke the bank, the Queen's Bank goots. 
Um, and then the other thing is it sends a bad message to all the other traders. Well, look, hey, he breaks the rules all the time. We'll break the rules. So rules, discipline, a structure, accountability. You know, one one good tip is that if you are trading, share your results with somebody that you trust and give them clear rules and say to them, hey, and it's got to be somebody you really trust and you, and you can value their opinion and they can be strong and stand up to you. I tried to do this with my wife and that led to that led to friction. Uh, we've never really had a problem in 30 odd years, but with the trading, because I said to her, look, these are the rules. If I break the rules, you've got to tell me off. So I would get to the end of the week. I brought in the rules and she'd say, hey, you 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 over over leveraged, over risk there. What are you playing at? Oh, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I, you know, I, so be accountable is part of it. Try to work on a bigger funded account is the solution to the problem if you've not got too much money. And if you've not got enough money and you can't get onto funded or you don't want to go down that route, treat the the demo account or the small account as education. You know, if you go to university these days, you're going to come out with 100,000 debt at least, no guarantee of a job, and it's going to take you three, four, five years. So if you've only got a few thousand dollars, Accept the fact it's going to take you a while to get there, but focus on the results, not the money. Anyway, I did that till 2007, 2008, and then I started to realize that I, I was getting paid a lot less than the other traders, and I started on Twitter. I started to post tips and advice on Twitter in its early days, and Twitter in the early days wasn't the the nastiness that you see on there now and the the polarized views you know you're either in one political camp or the other it was genuinely people were helping each other and giving giving out advice and i started posting and saying hey look you know i'm going to short the euro pound today at such and such a level for this reason uh, and people started saying hey this guy seems to know what he's talking about will you teach me and the crash came so we get the crash 2008 2009 and that was tricky. I mean, I was a wild ride. And so I started to think, well, okay, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll teach people. I'll teach people basics. And I enjoyed it because of this thing where you're, you're in a, your own little bubble and you don't get to talk to anybody. It was actually good for me. And it was also good for me because when I was bored, I was dangerous. I could very easily slip back into bad habits. Whereas if I was teaching somebody... And that that was part of the day. And I get a kick out of helping people to get there anyway. Um, then I created the membership site. And then after the crash 2008, 2009, all of this time was technical. It was purely technical. But then I started to pay attention to fundamentals because let's face it, it took the S&P four years to recover from the crash. And therefore you really needed to start to understand what's going on around the world, why you know why do, why does FX react in a certain way to certain news? I you would watch F, uh, NFP and it it shoot up and the dollar news was bad and uh, all these kind of things. So started to pay more attention to the fundamentals, which helped. Um, and nowadays I kind of say to people, look, this is two sides of the same coin. If you understand, for example, if you're trading the Aussie dollar and you're an American, what do you know about the Australian economy? And the general answer I get from folks is, <laughs> I had one guy said, oh, they've got kangaroos, haven't they? I said, yes, they have got kangaroos, but that's not how they make the money. Um, but if you understand that Australia, 40% of their exports go to China, then you understand that when there's bad news from China, that affects Australia. When there's friction with China politically and Australia, that is bad for them. And particularly, God forbid anything happens with China and Taiwan, that could be disastrous for Australia and the dollar and their economy because 40% of what they produce is going to China. So understanding the bigger picture, I, I believe, is, is, the, is the key to this. And, and in the last few years in 20, well, what do we do next? 2016, 2017, we did, my wife and I did the Australia trip. And then 2017, there was a, one, of the, one of the young guys I taught who uh, trades for a, a prop firm nowadays. He tried to get me into Bitcoin. And I didn't, I mean, I, this is ironic. I mean, I was, in, I was in currencies. I'd been in markets for 20 years at this point, And I didn't get it. I really didn't get it. I mean, I think he originally tried to get me into Bitcoin at four or $500. 
And I didn't understand it because I was just looking at it as a currency and didn't, you know, didn't see the value. And then 2020, 2019, I started to look at it from a fundamental point of view, understanding about blockchains and why the technology was equally, if not more important than the actual tokens. And I actually bought my first Bitcoin in February 2020 for $8,300. And three weeks later was the COVID crash and it went down to four. Um, but I was hooked. I and, and to me as well is if you've been doing something for a long time, I've been trading Forex for 20 years. I was getting bored. I could do it with my eyes closed. Uh, it wasn't... Uh, energizing me but crypto suddenly that was fun that that was the 90s all over again and uh, it actually worked better technically than forex in 2020 21 bitcoin bitcoin just went up pulled back up pulled back so if you were trading with a trend and you watched bitcoin if you play you go back and you place fibs on it 78.6 fib and an ema 78.6 fib in an EMA. It was easy. This time, because I'd done the um, dot com boom and I'd sat on the profits too long, this time I kept saying to my people, right, you've got to step one, the first goal with this, we need to get the original stake out. Because we, we started at 8K, we were at 64K when it peaked, as we know. Um, but all the way on the journey, on the way up, we were taking some profit, take out the original stake, look for the dips, buy the dips, keep going. Then the crash came, the first crash, when it dropped from 64 to 30. But if you look at a Bitcoin chart, you can see quite clearly 30K was a major line in the sun technically and from a support and resistance area. So we bought in again and it went up even higher to I think the second time 65K. At that point, I was saying all the way up to my people, get the money out, take money out, take profit out. I didn't see the crash coming as quickly as it did because nobody ever sees the tops and nobody ever catches the bottoms exactly. But I, I was fortunate I'd taken a chunk out. And my best performing client outperformed me and she turned 100K into 1.6 million in 15 months. This was insane. Um, but she, I was teaching people, we were buying all smaller tokens as well. She'd mainly bought Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ethereum went from 400 to 4k. Um, and then she bought a handful of the other ones that we, we recommended within the group. So that was exciting, but now that's gone to sleep and obviously it's tanked and I suspect it's, it's quite probably going to drop even further. Uh, but I've still got some Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoin will come into its own in the next couple of years. Uh, I suspect at the minute that we're on for a recession and a crash. So at the moment, I, I used exactly the same technical strategy for crypto as I did for, for sorry as for forex as I did with crypto, and I use the same thing nowadays for metals. Uh, I just bought some more gold yesterday and some silver on a pullback. And I'm now I'm also buying mining stocks for leverage. So you can you need to be doing something to keep yourself energized and interested. And so for me now, I I, I like to to understand what's going on. I, I explain to folks, you know, if the dollar's going up, then the money's coming out of the stock markets, coming out of crypto, because everything is interlinked and everything is cyclical. And so if you can catch the right cycle at the right time, you can make a lot of money. Hence the the thing with crypto. So I'm presuming you as a young guy were in the crypto as well. How did you get on with it? I wasn't too much into crypto to be fair. I was pretty much staying away from it, except like in the last year or so before the crash. And that's really kind of when I started to not invest too much or more trade it like on a like a on a trend basis, like you said. Uh, but I was mostly sticking to Forex because that's what I know best, what I trade best. So to me, going to different markets was like not really productive. And also there was a lot of hype back then. So that was kind of a scary little bit. I mean, the main thing with crypto, I didn't, use, I didn't use any leverage. I mean, I think if you're going to use leverage with crypto, you're going to get burned very, very quickly and very easily. So I was only buying and selling. 
Um, but as I say, the, the ability to be able to transfer the skill into, into different things I find very interesting. And because I trade from longer time frames nowadays, say this year, I didn't start trading till after Martin Luther King Day because generally over the Christmas period, the markets are sluggish. And yet I managed to make my target within 10 trading days. And I, I place on average fewer than five trades a month. I mean, I am not an active trader in that respect. But the reason is I'm only in this to make money. I'm not in this for the fun anymore. I've been doing it 20 years. Um, but I find it interesting to be able to do other things as well. as. So as I say, I, I still traded crypto through 2020, but uh, sorry, I still traded Forex, but crypto was way more profitable and it was really exciting and it was really interesting. And the other thing, because you realize how everything goes in cycles, you see when you when you go back to the dot-com boom, you, you'll often see marketers these days saying, hey, if you bought Amazon in 97 and you put 10K in, now you'd, you'd be 5 million in the bank. What people forget is that Amazon dropped 95% in the early 2000s, exactly the same as with crypto. So everything, you know, nothing is new. Everything recycles. Everything goes through the, the up and the down cycle. And therefore, if you can catch it and it's an added benefit, then that's useful. FX, you can make money. As we know, you make money when it's going up, it's going down, or it's going sideways. And say so my way that suits my personality better is I do all the planning on a weekend. That's when I spend most of the time. I look for multiple reasons for the entry and for the stop. And I calculate, I will never take a trade that will give me less than twice what I'm going to risk. And wherever possible, I place forward orders. Now, even if you want to trade shorter time frames, I recommend that people do it because if you're trading a 15-minute chart, the the big picture, you know, if the for example, the CAD, the CAD at 130, if you look at the CAD at 130, going back 20 years on a weekly chart, the amount of times that the, Can the US Canadian dollar has bounced to the pip of 130, both on the way up and on the way down, is probably 90% of the time. So if you're trading on a 15-minute chart, and the price is at 129.90, i.e. we're coming up to this major massive area that's that's been in place for 20 years, then that's not a good idea. So I, I recommend to folks, look at the big picture. You only need to do it on a weekend. Look on a weekly chart. I look for what I consider to be the sweet spot, the area that draws my eye. And ultimately, trading, technical trading is all about pattern recognition. It's not rocket science. It's just looking at these repeatable patterns all the time. And then you need the multiple reasons for to suspect that probably price is going to react in an area. And again, I, for me, trading is all about probability. Where is If it's done this in the past on multiple times, where is it most likely, most probable it's going to do it again? And so for me, it's all about support and resistance. The more forms of support and resistance I have in an area, the better. So horizontal support and resistance, trend lines, Fibonacci, uh, EMAs. I only use two EMAs these days, the 200 and the, and the 55. And again, you, you can watch it on a daily. The amount of times that price will come up and bounce off it to a pip is greater than 50% in my experience. Bitcoin, Bitcoin recently has stopped at 25,000. You look on a smaller time frame, why why is it stopped there? You go on to the weekly, it's bouncing off the 200 EMA. So to me, I start on the big picture, I start wide, I look at maybe 20 pairs, but I then narrow it down to maybe five or six pairs that I'm going to focus on for the week ahead, and those are the ones I then go down to the daily. I have a lot of people I've taught that trade off four hour but again, start with the big picture, understand what's going on, understand at le least a little bit about what makes the financial world work and why if money's flowing into the dollar, it's going to affect stocks and vice versa. If you watch what's happening in the stock market, it gives you a clue as what's going to happen with the dollar next. So all of these parts of the puzzle, if the more you understand it, then the better prepared you are, in my opinion. Interesting. Definitely a lot there. And I'm sure people ask about kind of what things you look at in the market. So you kind of broke this down a little bit and do the support areas to look at, and that, that's a good thing. 
what are some things that will make you get in the trade? Are there, are, are these like placed at levels directly without any sort of confirmation or do you have to look for something more clear that they, they kind of enter trades in that case? I look, say, I, I look on a weekly chart and on a weekly chart, I start off with candlesticks. That's, that's all I look at. I am looking at the structure. The basic thing that we want is it going up, down or sideways. And obviously we then need to, you know, if it's going sideways, then we're range trading. We need to adjust our strategy. I then add the, the EMA. So I add the 55 and the 200. Where are they? Which is giving me a clue, a further clue to direction. What are they doing? If they're together or near, then that starts to draw my eye because then that is an area where price is likely to react. So then I will add Fibonacci and I will add trend lines. And I basically start, it's a bit like an artist with a, a blank canvas. I'm adding bits to substantiate the idea. And the thing to me is, I mean, Fibonacci, why does a, a mathematical calculation from a 14th century Italian mathematician have anything to do with the stock market or with Forex? Well, the, the funds, a lot of the automated systems are using it. And you will often see price will bounce to the pip off the 50, 61.8, 78.6 fib to the pip. Why? Well, because if lots of AI and lots of automated systems and the big boys are using fibs, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But I wouldn't take a trade just because there's a, a, a major fib there. I want to see EMAs in the area. I want to see trend lines. A lot of people are trading the trend. They're all going to be looking at this weekly trend line. It's probably going to react there. So I kind of say to people, you would need four or five, ideally, for an A-grade trade on the forward order to place and walk away. You need four or five reasons to substantiate the theory, all in the same place. So you're looking for confluence. That's that's what I do. Very interesting. Yeah, it's a different way to do it, uh, which definitely makes sense. I heard the same thing about pivot points in the past where pivot points kind of used to be invented by the, the guys in the pit that had these levels to kind of trade and that's why they use them. And there's no really logic to it, but they were calculated back then and then therefore they work still these days. So maybe some principles Fibonacci or something similar. I, I, tried, uh, I tried pivot points in the early days. And again, pivot points work. But if you have pivot points, Fibonacci, EMAs and trend lines on, you never but take a trade because there's always something in the way. You know, you, you could find a really good entry for multiple reasons, and then there's a pivot point 20 pips above it. So I, I took the pivots off. So, you know, you, you choose your own thing. I used to have, I mean, I, I again, I listened to some of these uh, big guys that have been doing this for a long time, and they've got 20 systems. I've got one. I have used the same strategy for 20 years, and most Automated systems will go through a period where they do well and then they stop working. So you need another, you need another. But what I have done, I have taken things off. And, and years ago, I, I thought I'd invented the Holy Grail as we all do. We go through a phase and I had CCI, RSI, MACD, stochastics, and something else. If they all lined up in back testing, hey, this was a winning system. And guess what? In the real world, it didn't, or it did occasionally. So for me, over the years, I used to have smaller EMAs. I used to have pivots. I've taken them off. I prefer to work with the blank screen, but I don't just, I, I, I don't understand how people are successful when they say they just trade candlesticks. I, I, I don't understand how they do it. I know some people are successful at it, but for me, I don't have an edge with that. My edge, I am not a great trader. I am not uh, you know, when you talk to these 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 guys with the big funds that have managed billions, uh, and they they can read off the names of Jack Swagger and all these people, I, I, that's not me. I came from the retail end, and I came from the point of view where my entries are really good. I, I the joke within Forex Mentor Pro is that I am spookily accurate. I will often call an entry from hundreds of pips away to within two or three pips. So that's my edge. But it's nothing. It's not rocket science. It's just looking for repeatable patterns, and then it's looking for multiple reasons why price is probably going to react in an area. And it happened with the pound last week, I believe. There was some pound news came out. I don't trade the news per se, but if the starting price is 150, 200 pips away from a major area, I will take a trade through the news. And I caught the pound. There was a surge up on some pound news, and I caught it almost to the pip. 
and I'm still in it and it's up 400 pips and it was a 30 pip stop. But the but again, it wasn't rocket science. It was just, hey, if this thing sets off, where's it probably going to run out of steam? Where is it going to run out of buyers? And again, what people, when you just look at candlesticks, when I just looked at uh, technical analysis, you lose sight of what's going on here. What is happening in a Forex chart is it is an auction. It is a battle between the buyers and the sellers. And the buyers are looking for value, just like you and I. If you if you want to buy an item, you want to buy a car and the price has gone up too much, say, okay. If they, if they have a sale or they have a showroom model and they knock tank out, I'll go buy it. And it's the same with Forex. You get to a point where it becomes too expensive. The people who bought lower down start to get twitchy because they're thinking, hey, I could lose all my profit now. And if they're all looking at multiple things like fibs and trend lines, et cetera, et cetera, where is this thing probably going to run out of steam? And again, it's all about probability. Where is it probably going to react for as many reasons as possible? So that's my thing. And that's my edge. Say, I am not a great trader. I get out too soon. Everybody gets out too soon, in truth. Um, I don't day trade anymore, so I'm not sat there for hour after hour. I retired from trading for uh, private clients a few years ago. I, I don't need the hassle. Um, you know, life's too short. I teach people. I take a few people a month, as and when I want to do. And my goal now is just to travel more. So uh, just prior to COVID, we, we, my wife and I planned three months around Asia. Uh, we're going to do it now later this year uh, and trade on the way around to pay for it like last time. And uh, yeah, life's good. Definitely cool lifestyle there. Now, you mentioned a while back in an interview where you had a period where you were over trading, you were kind of in the moment, being more led by emotions. How does one get away from that? Because a lot of people kind of reach out to me. They are in this kind of circumstance right now. They, they know they over trade. You know, they always like kind of getting in an impulse. Is it just a matter of like changing time frames, or is it something else you can do to kind of get out of that? Changing time frames is a big help. Um, I say to people, if people come to me pri interested in working with me privately, I said the first thing I say to them, look, wh why are you doing this? What, what, what do you mean? You know, why? Well, it fascinates me. It interests me. What really scares me if somebody comes to me thinking about uh, private coaching, if they sat in a gaming chair. Because if they're sat in a gaming chair, I kind of think, oh, dear, here we go. They, these people, you know, they, they're going to be, they like things that are moving. They like things that are sexy. I, I had a guy a few years ago um, who he he started trading and he doubled his account. And then he started trading for family and friends. Bad, bad idea. Doubled his account. So then he started, he quit his job. And you kind of know what's coming next. He blew it all up because he was just on the luckiest streak ever. But he, he had talent. He was potentially, it certainly was a better trader than me, but he couldn't control the the urges and he couldn't he, he couldn't stick to the structure. So I said to him, look, he's sat in a gaming chair. I said, what, what, what do you like doing? I like gaming. And this was 10, 15 years ago. He liked poker, it turned out, the more I got to know him. I said, well, why don't you play poker online if you're good at it and you can make money and just think of trading the only reason I trade is to make money. I don't do it for the fun. I don't do it for the, the intellectual channel challenge anymore. I do it to make money. So first and foremost, decide why what, what you're in this for and why you want to do it. If you do it because you like to sit there six, eight hours a day, then you've got to get the strategy that suits your personality. And my personality, as I said earlier, I, I two weeks ago, I, I was like a bloody drug addict that had suddenly reverted after 20 years to some of the bad habits. So for me, the solution was to step back. The other solution you can have is you go off and you get some psychology coaching, which I did, but it's a, it's kind of a lengthy process and it still leaves you, it leaves you with ways of, of being able to adapt to what's going on and to react differently, but you are still the captain of your own ship. And because this is a lonely game and because you generally, if you're working from home in your spare room or, or in your basement and you have nobody to watch over you, then my personality type, that's dangerous. So psychology is definitely a path that you can go down. 
um, accountability. I, I, I say to people, look, buddy up with somebody, buddy up with somebody in a forum that you can say to them, right, these are the rules. And that's another important thing. And step one, step one, what I do with somebody, if they come to me for private, I say to them, right, first thing you need is a business plan. What are you trying to achieve? What hours have you got available to do this in? Uh, think, you know, imagine if you were opening a, a cafe, you go to the bank, you go with a business plan. This is what I'm going to do. This is the opening hours. This is what equipment I need. This is the times of day the business is going to operate. And this is how I'm going to make a profit. And the end game is I want to sell this in three years' time for a profit. This is how I'm going to do it. So I have a business plan. The second thing is interweave with that a life plan. Lots of people. I mean, years ago, my average private client was in his 50s. He was male. He was middle management or own business. And he was thinking about retirement and not having enough money. In the last few years, and especially since COVID, I've had a lot of guys your age and girls these days, and their goal is travel. They want to be able to travel. And what COVID made a lot of people realize is that, hey, you know, if the governments hadn't bailed them out or the company they work for has laid them off, nobody gives them monkeys. You know, you've got to learn to be able to, to be self-sufficient. This is a great skill to have for that. You can live and work anywhere in the world. I was living on a tiny island off the coast of Africa where the average wage is less than a thousand bucks a month. I was able to earn a first world income because I can trade. But have a business plan and a life plan and set yourself some goals and say, hey, within a year, I want to be able to quit the job and I want to be going to Asia for three months. And this is how I'm going to get there. The second part of it is you need trading plan and rules. And you need to write them out. It's it's proven that if you write things down uh, and you look at them every day and you try to try to make it part of your DNA, this is what I do. This is what defines me as a trader. This is what gives me my edge. This is what I need to do every day. And then I say, if you can make yourself accountable. So I, I started working for myself in a, a bricks and mortar business. I started my first business when I was 21. And I had a partner who was a lot older than me. And he said to me, I've always remembered, he said, imagine, even though we're doing this for ourselves and we're the boss, imagine that the, the real boss is in the next office. And at the end of the week, you have to justify your existence within the company to this third party. And it's the same with trading. If you can justify why you made a decision, you know, if you have a plan for the week and it's written down and you, let's say you want to long the uh, dollar this week and you just go in short, short, short and you, you lose, lose, lose. Unless you can justify to your trading journal and to the guy in the other room, why did you do it? Then you're breaking the rules. So it's all about structure, discipline and rules. But that is the hardest, hardest part of all of this. And I said at the beginning, anybody can learn to trade technically it's not complicated but what screws everybody up is this and how you deal with that is partly dependent on your personality i mean what what do you when you trade itm what do you do i trade the same yeah very similar to you higher time frame so i trade the one hour chart and forward chart one hour is where i get the, the, the most setups but something i can really trade all the time so i've got some goals i've got over the years to help me to take these trades so the trading I do is still the, the same thing manually and the same strategy, but I have not go running it on that same strategy again uh, and taking the trades all the time. So that helps for traveling also. Because like I was in a place back like a few years where I was traveling like like you are also and I was taking trades and I was misloading because I was on a flight. I was on a boat. I was just sleeping totally for any reason. And then having an algo kind of coded for my strategy helps to, to, to fix that. Uh, so yeah, very similar. What I do, I mean, I say to people that we, we have, uh, there's a really cool piece of software that you can buy. It's a hundred bucks and this thing manages your trades for you. And what it will do is, it, unlike, I never use trailing stops because you always, always get it taken out with trailing stops with the, the kind of the, the market pattern on a daily basis. But what this thing will do is, let's say you've, you've started with a 50 pip stop. You can tell it when you place the trade and say, okay, when we get 50 pips in profit, move the stop to entry plus two or three. When the trade gets 100 pips in profit, take off 40% of the profit. When it gets to 100, and move the stop again. And when it gets to 150 pips in profit, do the same thing again. So that, to me, 
is almost nirvana because if you can focus on the entries for multiple reasons, as I've explained before, where you it has the possibility to make at least twice what you risk, and I have quite a few trades at the moment have got potential to make 10x, and all you need is one or two of them in a month to make your money. Uh, but if you then hand over the management of the trade to software, it takes you out of the equation. I have a guy, I have a, guy a young guy, who uh, nearly got sacked from his job a couple of years ago. And the reason was he was he'd become addicted to trading, as lots of folks do, and he got it on his phone. As again, lots of young guys have got them on the phone. He was constantly on the phone. So he was then constantly going to the toilet to check his trades. One of the directors of the company went into the toilets thinking that he'd got maybe a medical problem and could they help him? And they find him is there trying to manage his trades. Uh, so again, it, it, it is addictive. It is, you know, it it's the emotion that screws everybody. So let the software manage it. So next time you're on a plane or next time you're on a boat, it doesn't matter. It takes you out of the equation. To my shame, I had instances in my early days when I have gone out and I have been to a bar and gone home and I have interfered with trades. And I, I remember waking up one morning thinking, oh, great, the, the pounds go up another 150 pips. And it's like, what the heck? I'm out. Why the hell am I out? You know, I'm ring the broker. What's going on? Oh, sugar. I came back last night from a bar, having had two or three beers, and I made a stupid decision. Take you out of it. Learn the skill. Because the other thing is EAs, some EAs work for some of the time. Most don't in my experience, but some work some of the time. But of course, they are programmed to work on a certain specific market pattern. And when the market pattern changes, the EA doesn't know any different and it keeps doing what it does. And 99 times out of 100, it ends in tears. So what if you become the master of the, your ship, you learn the entries and focus on the entries and let the software manage it for you? Now it's Nirvana. And I have a lot of American and Canadian and Australian clients who London opens when they're in bed for, for the Americans and Canadians. So they would often go to bed and say, I was in a winning trade. London opened. It pulled back sharply, took me out, and I missed on the profits. Uh, and I, actually, I had a German guy the other day using this software. I say it's, it's pennies. Uh, it, we don't make any money out of it, but it's a real cool piece of software. But this thing... The, the guy from Germany was saying he'd gone to the mall, gone shopping, left his trade open, came back, and whilst he was out, the price had shot up 70 pips and come back down to where it was when he'd gone out. Because he was using this software, the software took the profit on the spike, and he had a winning trade. So for me, master the, men, the entries, master understanding what's going on, and then pass the management off to the software. That that is life changing for many people. You know what that software is called? People might want to check it out. I'll give you the link for it. Um, I I can't remember. It, it's not a very interesting name, but I I'll give you the link for it, and you can put it in the video. Yeah, I'll definitely put the link in the video. That sounds good. Uh, speaking of which, you mentioned that you traded one strategy, and how do you adapt to different kind of market conditions, different let's say the trends, sideways? Is it where you adapt kind of your entries to different trending conditions, different sideways condition? Or is it like you stay away from different conditions in the market? It's more to do with profit than not. You can still find entries using my strategy on, on a range, but it's just then being real. You know, if it's in a range, don't be thinking you're going to make 10x on it because it's going to probably going to bounce off where it is. So it, it's more a case of being able to, uh, to to look at things in that respect. And we covered a lot in this interview, but anything we didn't kind of touch on or talk about, you want to pass on to the, the viewers or the listeners? One of my guys years ago wrote an interesting article, and it, it, its title was, if you treat trading like a hobby, it will pay you like a hobby. If you treat it like a business, it will pay you like a business. And that, for me, goes back to this thing. Most people are hobby traders. They're trading around a job. They're doing it as on the side. Uh, they don't do it with structure. They don't do it with rules. Don't do it with, different, with, with discipline. Create a plan. Write it down. It's boring. You know, people say to me, how did you go from losing for three years to trading on a, on a funded account? And it was starting to treat it like a business, having a plan, having clear rules, having accountability, having structure. 
And that for me is it. I mean, the final bit of it is there's a quote by uh, Calvin Coolidge, one of the, the uh, well, as far as the Brits go, lesser known US presidents. And it's all about persistence. In fact, I, I got it on screen somewhere. Just bear with me. He says, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. And I think that if you want to be successful in everything, anything, you have to persevere. They say that I think in the UK, 70% of the new businesses fail within three years. And that's that's general, I think, around the world. They say in trading, there's a there's a saying that 90-90-90 rule, 90% of new traders lose 90% of their account within 90 days because they don't know what they're doing. So you need a plan, you need the rules, you need structure, and then the, the old Americanism, when the going gets tough, you the tough get going. But don't keep repeating the same mistakes over and over because you'll you'll end up nowhere. So persistence is key. Structure is key, um, rules, discipline, and the business plan. Definitely a lot there for sure. So where can people find you? They want to connect with you, reach out to see what you're doing these days. Where can they connect with you? Okay. We uh, we have a, a membership site, which is mem- forexmentorpro.com. And uh, I, I have a waiting list usually for private clients, but I do take uh, one or two people a month generally uh, if I think that I can help them. And we're on Twitter now and then. Twitter's changed these days, but we're on social media as well. So if anybody wants to get in touch, then they can get a hold of us now. Awesome. I'll try to put a link below the view if you want to check it out also in the podcast show notes so they can go directly to your website. I'll check the link itself so you talk about too on the, the show notes. People can have a look at it too. That'll be cool. Okay. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate your time. I think it's been good advice and look forward to catch up with you and see how you're doing in the future.